everyone. I want to uh, welcome everyone to uh, session 15 today of Track C. And uh, our speaker this afternoon is going to be Valerie Logan, and she is the CEO and founder of the Data Lodge. Uh, Valerie is going to be talking with us today about data literacy and the Pioneer's Advantage. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Donna. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Hi, everyone. I heard there's going to be 93 people. Is, are they counting like me, myself, and I? Is that what they're doing? OK, no, that's good. Hello, people online. Um, so it's great to be here. I just want to double check, make sure. OK, everything's working. Good. Um, there are so many great slots right now, sessions, 515 slot. What's your theory on why there are so many great slots at 515 sessions? Keep people around, absolutely. So what's that say about me? Pretty good, right? <laughs> no, sincerely, really, thanks, Kokolo. <laughs> um, really glad to have everybody here. If I had a um, $100 bill for every time data literacy was mentioned at the conference so far. Even a dollar. Even a dollar. I think we'd all be holding this at the, at the bar. So um, I was having lunch with two um, amazing uh, uh, women and we were talking about being pioneers and I realized that this December I have another pioneering anniversary so my husband and I met on AOL in December of 1998 we were internet dating pioneers thank you <laughs> met in a chat room um, that's where the story will end <laughs> um, but seriously I uh, I, how many of you consider yourselves, and, and please, in the chat, I know some of my clients and people are in the chat, so please engage in the chat. I obviously can't see it, but please play along. How many of you in this room consider yourselves pioneers? Yeah, and somebody give me a reason. What's the reason why you, sit, you think you're a pioneer? Dharma, what about you? No, for the audience, yeah. for the. In general, I really like to change the status quo. Love it. And I'm a sucker for punishment. Yeah. And I take new challenging things. I've done that over and over again in my yeah. career. I love it. Thanks. Yeah, for, uh, for example, uh, one of my favorite projects I did was uh, an EVP came and said, oh, I want to have a small fund to give like money to I ideas, let's, let's build a spreadsheet, right? You start everything with a spreadsheet. <laughs> I said no, this was like many years ago, 10 uh -huh. years ago. We put a crowd crowdsourcing platform, connected 42 people, clinical research assistants from 42 countries, and we had a, we had a wonderful innovation program. You know, it's an idea. It's not necessarily stopping at what's asked for, but looking a little beyond that. And it's the passion, right? The passion to make it happen. And uh, in Randy Bean style, it's the willingness to fail fast if needed, right? Um, so welcome, pioneers. My theory is that you're probably all pioneers if you pick this session at 5.15 on uh, day two. All right, so um, one of my favorite quotes that I use all the time is, we don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. So every one of you, virtual and in person, are going to experience this session through your own life and work lens. So I welcome you to personalize it and customize it. And I would encourage you to challenge yourself, and I say this at the beginning, see if you can take what I share with you and challenge yourself, set the intention that you will share it back with those that you wish to share it with. If you set that intention now, you will listen differently. You will engage differently. That's my hypothesis. So challenge yourself to teach it, because you know what happens when we teach something. We learn it at a deeper level, right? I believe we don't really learn, know something, unless we can teach it, right? All right, so one of my favorite quotes. So what I'm going to do, um, so first of all, Valerie Logan with the Data Lodge, I just realized there's so many people I know. I'm like, everybody knows me. <laughs> um, so I um, started my life in the, I was born in a cabin. Remember we were talking about that at lunch. Um, so 
I was originally a very nerdy, shy math girl until the age of 22. People would, ne first of all, my, people that know me now would never believe that, and people that knew me then would never see me now. Um, math helped me find my voice. Solving problems and data helped me build community and build a great career. Um, throughout my career, I learned, I, I kept being called on as a translator. How many of you operate as a constant translator? All the time, right? So when you're a translator, you're probably a good listener, you probably ask great questions, and you probably care about people actually communicating and connecting on a topic. So I had that kind of ability um, over the years in consulting. Well, I joined Gartner to be an analyst just as the CDO role was emerging. What a great time <laughs> to join the Gartner CDO team. And I started developing out the culture in data literacy research. It took off. It was the right message at the right time. I had incubated something that I'll share with you called Information as a Second Language, ISL, built off of what? What's the pair? English as a second language, right? So I believe data is as pervasive and universal as English has been as a global language, and I think we have to codify it to scale it. So I'll be sharing that with you, and again, I challenge you to learn it in a way that you can, you can share with others. So I run a company called The Data Lodge. I left Gartner because people said, love the theory on data literacy, that's really great, but how in hell do you build these programs and change people? And so I started a company four years ago, hard to believe, right, Danielle? Um, four years ago, I'm not a consultant, I don't have a consulting company, I have a train-the-trainer model. Part of my philosophy is you don't change culture from the outside, you change it from the inside. The trick is CDOs want to put a data literacy program in place, but those things don't really exist, so how do their people learn it and figure it out? So I have a train-the-trainer model, I run boot camps for data literacy leads, I have a community, and there are 60 people, 60 pioneers in my community now after four years who are running data literacy programs around the world. So that is my body of work, almost my life's body of work, because I'm quite obsessed on the topic. Okay, so. I would encourage you, if anyone wants to talk to you about data literacy, you better get clear on what you mean by it. You Google search data literacy, you are gonna have so many varied definitions. Very first objective is what are you solving for and what do you mean by it? And I'm not doing this to give you the basic, like here we go with the definition. I'm doing this to get really clear on what is it you're trying to achieve with data literacy. So I will go through and I will define it, I will share with you what I think pioneers are, and then I'm gonna to talk to you about data literacy programs and what is in a data literacy program. I'm gonna stay after, I'll hang out with anybody who wants to chat, um, so yeah, I'm that obsessed. I will stay, like, however long. So, first question, how many of you, and please, in the chat, virtually, um, I know some of my people around there, please facilitate, um, do you speak a second language? Hands up. How many speak at least a second language? How many speak three languages? <laughs> He's got two hands up. Four languages? Oh, five languages? Oh, six? Okay, we went down at six. Nice. Um, Gokula. What languages? Just quickly. So when I was uh, <coughs> as a child, when in the area that I was growing up, uh, we had our own state language called Odia. Oh. And then uh, Hindi. Yep. And then English, and then Sanskrit. Nice. And then I traveled around the country um, and picked up a few other languages like Marathi, Bengali. Uh, I understand a little bit of Telugu because my grandma used to speak Telugu. Uh, nice <laughs> <laughs> Very and, good. And so, yeah, that's how you pick I up. I love it. I also learned French in Morocco because no one would understand English. So. <laughs> yeah, well they might understand it, they just didn't choose to respond to it. <laughs> Sorry, that was my outside voice. Okay, so um, how many of you would say you speak data? Come on people, you are at the CDO IQ Symposium. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll check again towards the end. All right, so I'm gonna give you, on the next slide, there are gonna be seven letters. It's gonna be a quiz. If you've seen me present and you know the answer, zip it. I see you, Nick. 
Um, so there's gonna be seven letters. It's gonna be a, a little puzzle that you have to figure out what it represents. And I'm gonna call on four people to tell me what it represents. Here we go. X, F, M, D, P, N, F. Take a minute and look at that. Everybody's freaking out, not making eye contact with me because they're concerned. Anybody, I'm actually not gonna call on anybody. Anybody wanna take a guess what it is? Scott, I told you. <laughs> if you knew the answer, no, just kidding. Scott, I would have been so disappointed if you didn't say anything. Here's what it is. The big reveal. It's one letter off in the alphabet. Why did I do that? Why do I share this with you? Because that's rhetorical, unless you know. <laughs> I'm a cryptologist at heart, yeah. Or I like to punish people and make them feel horrible. Um, there's a pioneer in the literacy movement you'll hear about in a minute named Ruth Colvin. She starts her literacy presentations with this exercise, and she says it's because we need to remind ourselves what does it feel like when you don't know something? Your constituents in your organizations do not speak data and do not understand this little language we're all speaking here. And many of them are scared to death about it. They think they could lose their jobs. They're afraid of being embarrassed. They've been nodding politely at terms, including your executive team because they don't wanna be the one in the room to admit they don't know something. Part of this work is creating safety and em have holding empathy and creating a space where everybody brings something to this language. So I encourage you to try that with your teams, just to remind everybody, everybody brings something to the party here, right? There's no reason to feel bad about being left out. Okay, so with all of that, Let's finally get to what is data literacy. So with the research, Kayvon, uh, I heard him speak yesterday in the keynote. Um, I love that piece of research from McKinsey about the seven characteristics of a data-driven enterprise. Love that. And this actually was last year's study, um, but kind of the same gist. Uh, I didn't update it to the 2023 study, but Randy's study, um, I think it's now like almost 80% of CDOs cult cite culture as the biggest challenge, order of magnitude about the same. That is a great data point for the case for change for data literacy, right? Great evidence. I believe there is no such thing as data culture if you even, first of all, I don't think there's really data culture. It's business culture infused with data or empowered by data, but I also don't think there's any such thing as data culture without data literacy. You don't have literacy without language, and how do you have culture without language? You don't, right? Language is so pervasive. So if you take a little bit of trip down memory lane, 2017 to 19, this topic of data literacy started to emerge. I was at Gartner doing research. There's the Data Literacy Project with Click and Accenture and Pluralsight had put, a, they still have a lot of great resources out. Woman in Australia doing data literacy assessments called Databilities, her company's data to the people. And then Ben Jones up in Seattle with data literacy company, some great pioneers, right? Well, then, of course, what happens in 2020 is the world changes, has an unexpected awakening and a tipping point with COVID, and all of a sudden data literacy got real. People might not call it that, but the ability to, to view and interpret the John Hopkins dashboard and to make decisions, what kind of decisions were people making in COVID? Shut down, don't shut down. Shut down, don't shut down. Mask mandates. Mask mandates, vaccine, go to the store, send my kids to school, let them play, go to the family reunion, all kinds of decisions. And people you thought never would be looking at a dashboard like this were studying that dashboard. And how many people could understand seven day moving average, right? So that was a, a huge social experiment on the need for personal data literacy. 
But that is really representative of our employee population. So if there's that degree of discomfort, one would say there's probably quite a bit in, in companies. So it could no longer be ignored. So it's not only critical to workforce upscaling, it's critical to how we live our lives. And this is gonna thread throughout the presentation because I don't think you come from corporate to the company and say, here we go. I, and Ashley, I'm thinking of your session today, right? Ashley's a CDO in a um, metals company. Is that the right way to say it? Yeah. Um, and, and, and you know, you can't be going to that, to the environment and say, I'm here to help teach you the language of data. They will boot you out, right? Um, so I believe that the way we affect this change with the humans that we're supporting in our organization is by making it personal, make the personal connection. So this is making it personal as travelers, as parents, as consumers, as voters, right? The misinformation of the world right now, the reason that that exists is because we are not discerning consumers of information. That is not a mindset or a muscle, but we can help with that. And guess what? We have a responsibility to help with that because we understand the data, we understand the methods, and we understand the problems we're trying to solve. So what's in a name? The beloved term data literacy. Some people hate it. Why do people hate the term data literacy? Why do some people have an allergic reaction to the term data literacy? What's your, any thoughts? Yes. It implies illiterate. It implies illiterate. With, with what language in the world do we have a Boolean value of you're either literate or you're illiterate? But somehow we have this reaction to data literacy, which, my, my take on any time someone has a really strong reaction, lean in. They're engaged. If they're giving you that reaction, don't fight it, ask. What, what is it about that that concerns you? What is it that bothers you? My theory is data literacy is the right foundational term, and I'll share with you why in a minute, but here's the headline. Data literacy, it's kind of a math pun, you're gonna like this. Data literacy is the lowest common denominator. Thank you, Danielle, for laughing. It's the lowest common denominator. From literacy, you can have fluency for those that choose to drive that direction and mastery. But if you start at fluency, you're gonna leave a whole bunch of people out. So my theory is, I think you start with literacy, but whatever you pick, be intentional and clear why you're picking it. And give yourself headroom with whatever you pick, right? So all kinds of different terms. I'm just sharing with you, I choose the term data literacy. I believe it is the right foundational term for those reasons. So uh, yeah, a lot of time in and I'm finally at the definition of what I call data literacy. Data literacy is the ability to read, write, and communicate with data in context, underlined, should have a disco ball. In context is everything. Context matters. How the CEO interacts with data, how Danielle interacts with data, how a UPS driver or the Walmart store clerk interact with data, completely different. So I suggest putting in context in the definition so everyone knows this isn't a one size fits all proposition from corporate. It's also a work and a life skill. If you demonstrate the data literacy and explain that it is this capability that is not only for their role at work, but also in their life, you might have a chance in getting their attention if you make it personal. There are three things that I believe make up one's data literacy. The very first and foremost is mindset. What's an example of something that someone will say that indicates a negative mindset towards data? Any thoughts? I don't, I don't trust it. Ooh, that's good. I've not heard that one. That's good. Yeah, I don't trust it I'm or. A lawyer, so I deal with the absence. <laughs> <laughs> He's a lawyer, so he deals with the absence of trust, he said. <laughs> um, mindset also shows up as this isn't relevant to me, I'm not a data person. Heard that once or twice, right? So mindset, this is about opening up, being, being open, willing, and curious, right? Being curious with data. And I love the phrase, seeing the world through data glasses. Um, 
what's the captain's name that presented from the Coast Guard? Can't remember his name. When he presented this morning, he showed, if you were in that session, he showed a, a picture of a big um, ship and he said, what do you see? And there was like a little, there was a, a little boat next to it and there were people and stuff. And he's like describing it and he says, I see data. He's looking at that through data glasses. It's a great, powerful metaphor. We all see things through data glasses because we're used to seeing the data. Most people do not. So offer them to try on data glasses. Gokla, you got a microphone? I have also heard people saying, I know everything I need. Yeah. I don't need to. Yeah. <laughs> I've never run into anybody like that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It, and I have a, and I, my approach for that is thank you for volunteering. Because if you know everything, come join us. And you can help teach the others. Yeah? So, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, first, mindset. Secondly, my favorite, language. So, when you hear the term data literacy, often people think, oh, she's just talking about data. Well, just like data strategy is not just about data, it's really about informing a business strategy, data literacy is not just about data elements. What good would that be? So data literacy, I scope it as three things. And I'm going to give you a little mnemonic in a minute to, to remember it. But it's business acumen, data acumen, and analytical acumen. It's the three ingredients for any problem you're going to solve with data. What problem are you solving, and how do you describe it? What data is involved, and how do you ex understand it? And what analytical method from a bar chart to Gen AI, I said it, do you have bingo? We should do bingo. We should have done bingo in this. Um, Gen AI, whatever method it is that's being applied to the data to derive the value. So data literacy is those three areas of literacy, business data and analytical acumen. When you scope it that way, then everybody's welcome to the party, okay? Third part are very specific skills. And some of these are the ones that you tend to hear about. So I've boiled it down now to thinking. So how does one think? How does one engage? And how does one apply or take an action? Thinking would be critical thinking, appreciation of the scientific method, if needed. Um, engaging would be good old data storytelling, the beauty of being able to engage others by telling an effective data story. And then the last one, applying, this is where you get into bias and ethics and responsible usage. Do people understand when they are acting and applying or taking action on the data that they have a responsibility with that? So I have taken the whole body of work of data literacy and boiled it down to this. If you take nothing out of this, remember the quote, <laughs> remember the definition, the context, and mindset, language, and skills. And I'm going to quiz you in a few slides to see who gets that. OK. So let's go through some examples. Limited, I, I'm getting away from saying poor and good because it's so like, you know, not nice. I shouldn't do that. But limited and strong data literacy. Limited can be if you react, assume, or avoid. We don't see this on Facebook at all, <laughs> reacting to headlines, right? Maybe friends and family, like, oh, why is that going on? It's like, is there a source? Is there assumptions? Did you, do you know where that's coming from? Not my family. Uh, um, uh, no. <laughs> um, contrasted with the art of being comfortable asking a good question and being curious. The second would be, and again, I'm sure you never see this, um, just give me all the data. I'll figure out what to do with it later. Contrasted with, I want to be confident in how I can describe the problem so I can collaborate with you in identifying what data is relevant, what method could we use. Right, that's the contrast. Third, assuming and not knowing the sources or the quality of the data and still acting on it and assuming that it's, well, we have it, so let's just use it. Contrasted with, I know where that data comes from. I know whether it's a certified data set. I know the degree of quality. It doesn't have to be perfect. Maybe it's good enough for the scenario and the situation you have. And being able to confidently tell a data story. 
Again, a behavior you never see in your organizations of not wanting to share data and hoarding data. I believe one root issue of hoarding data is lack of data literacy or limited data literacy. And, and it's not maybe the, of that one person, but they may not want to share it with someone who they're like, I don't think they really even know anything about this data. So if you have a culture of a common language and a shared confidence around data, that can raise the willingness to share responsibly. So contrasted with collaboration. And then finally, some people just go, screw it, I'm not sure, peace out, I'm just gonna like make up my own decision versus I know where to go to help or to get help. These make sense, just kind of basic, right? Okay, so mindset. I wanna pick on mindset for just a minute. Watch for these when you go back to your organization. And remember, these are invitations to engage. They're not meant to just annoy you. First, limiting belief, because the mindset is really about limiting beliefs. First one, I'm not a data person. When I hear I'm not a data person, I say, oh, you don't have a smartwatch. Oh, you don't drive a vehicle. Oh, you've never looked at a nutrition label and made a decision whether to put it in your shopping cart. Limiting belief, that's an IT thing. Well, drones are IT things. Didn't you get one as a holiday gift? Uh, connected homes are IT things with sensors and connected family or, um, phones and cameras, and if you have an electric car, that's kind of an IT thing, and you're all revved up about that. I'm not good at math. But you're the first one the day after Thanksgiving going shopping for all the sales, and you can calculate with the best. You are also the one that does the travel planning for the big family trip, and you're tracking on-time travel stats, and you're weighing all that out, and you're the one that's assessing mortgage rates and looking at payments. Last one, this isn't relevant to me, similar to Gokula's point. Well, it better be relevant to you if you wanna monitor your health in the future. It better be relevant to you about you caring, if you care about what you and your family and your kids put on social media. And it better matter to you if you are gonna watch the news. So I don't be, do this to be snotty, I do it to create the point the big headline here is we are all data people, period. <laughs> we are all data people. The way that we can approach data literacy is through the door of inviting people to acknowledge they already use data, and the way you're gonna teach them concepts around data literacy is by sharing how you can look at that. You can look at correlation and causality with spurious correlations, you know that site? that like, uh, what is it, the divorce rate in Maine is correlated with consumption of margarine, right? Make it fun, make it, people will remember that. You will remember that I said that in this session, right? Okay, so the need for a shared language. I get the question all the time, how on earth do you carve up the organization into personas? The highest level persona grouping is these four personas. Basically, there's those, let's start on the far right. There's those who have data as a role. Most, many of them are at this conference. CDOs, data scientists, data engineers, prompt engineers, these are data as a role. Data analytics as a role. There's data within a role, which a lot of that is those that are the citizen um, analysts within the business functions, anyone who's maybe not in the central team, or they could be dispersed out. They could be as a role or in a role. And then there's data in the day-to-day -day job. It could be entering the data, it could be interacting with the data, and, and data, of course, I, I play this game with my family now, it's like, give me examples of data. I was doing this with my 10-year-old grandnephew the other day. I'm like, what do you think data is? And he's like, um, like my, my score on my, on my video game? I'm like, good, good. And then I went through and I, I went through and I said, do you think this is data? I said, do you think, um, when I send you an email, do you think that's data? He goes, ah. And I said, it has to represent something. If data like represents it, he's like, yeah. I said, is Cooper, he's our dog. I'm like, is Cooper data? He goes, no, Cooper's not data. You know, I said, is the color of Cooper data? He's like, yeah, he got it, 10 years old, right? So data in a day-to-day -day basis, people that are entering data, interacting with data, using data analytics, 
um, on, a, on a more casual basis to the extent necessary. And then leadership across. You have CDOs all the way to the right, right? Leaders that data is your role, all the way down to data is less, um, data analytics are less prevalent. So this is why I say that literacy is the lowest common denominator across that whole population. If you break up that proportionately, you're probably looking at something like 60, 20, 10, and another 10 at the top, something like that. If you're a heavy science-based organization, it's probably not following on the, that distribution, but you're looking at the mass of people who are probably in the day-to-day, -day, but you have to describe, then you break it down by persona from there. So literacy, fluency then, is probably people that have an interest in a role and up, and then as a role, you could call mastery. So again, if you're trying to demystify this data literacy topic, here's how you can look at it in context with the other terms. Okay. When we talk about a shared language, what I'm really talking about is one of the best things you can do is depict the different roles across your organization in visual form. One of the things you get to do, it being in a data and an analytics central function, is you get to see the broader organization, and a lot of people don't. So if you can put that experience on paper to depict what the different roles of the organization are, different functions, different go-to-market, different back office functions, all of a sudden people can go, oh, I know what you mean by a shared language. This is, what, this is the roles that we're talking about. What's happening here, I believe, and I'm, I'm tentative of whether, I don't want to mix this with, with um, DEI work, but there is a kind of diversity emerging here, which is diversity of background. And if you think about it, there's this, I hate this whole like business versus IT thing. Oh, and, like, it's just like, it's so ingrained in culture right now. But I think what we're doing with this work is we are creating bridges between business stakeholders data management and IT stakeholders, and analytical quants. I think that's the language that we're facilitating, and it's why it feels so complex. So this is part of why we're creating a shared language. So finally, this whole idea of ISL, it's not just a cute marketing phrase. I have codified this. I've been working at this for, I started this in 2013. I've been doing hardcore data literacy seven years now, and I've boiled this method down it's a recipe, you get the benefit of seeing it here and embracing it and leverage to your heart's content. The ISL method is based on three things. First of all, that there is a vocabulary structure for speaking data, and it's based on those three sets of terms. I created this little triangle. Everybody loves a triangle, right? You can draw a triangle with three letters. You don't like triangles? <laughs> squares, you prefer squares. <laughs> So everybody, everybody can remember a triangle, the VIA model, I call it. Somebody, and I was teaching this once, and um, somebody from Italy said, do you know the meaning of VIA? It's the way, which is kind of cool. Um, so vocabulary construct, VIA, value, which is the business acumen, information, and analysis. Any use case that you are deploying or solving for those are the three sets of terms. What you can do is if you have a new use case evolving and you bring a team together, do a check. Do, peop, do the members of that team understand the basic terms in each part of that triangle? If not, they're gonna pass each other in the hallways, right? So the VIA model. Secondly, that VIA model then gets contextualized by dialects. Give me an example of what you think a dialect could be. Industry. Industry. Oh, sorry, I had it on there. <laughs> right? Industry. So every industry is its own dialect, and every business process domain is its own dialect, and I'm going to layer on topic. ESG is a topic. DEI is a topic. And all of those have their own sets of data and sets of terminology. So what I'm offering you here is a way to deconstruct the complexity. There's a great quote, it's not, it's Oliver Wendell Holmes. I kept saying Mark Twain, it's Oliver Wendell Holmes. And it's, um, I wouldn't give, I've never used the word fig, but I wouldn't give a fig 
for the simplicity on this side of complexity, but I give my life for the simplicity on the other side of complexity. This is a way to distill this down and simplify it. Otherwise, if you did a word cloud over this conference, it would be a crazy amount of words and people that aren't in our field and aren't in our major, just they wouldn't get it, right? So you need, if we're gonna scale this language and scale this capability, we need a way to frame it. So, as I mentioned, what were the M, L, and S in the definition? M is mindset, L is language, S, skills, right. So now we get into the skills, thinking, engaging, applying, because language is only good if you actually do something with it, right? And then you can look at levels of proficiency and say not everybody has to be fluent. Some, it's totally fair if you're just conversational, versus others will be multilingual because they know multiple industries, multiple domains. And then finally, you don't, big message here, you do not learn a language by only going through training. It's peace, it's a big piece. Assessments, Duolingo, my husband's learning Spanish on Duolingo. Every night in bed he's doing the little talking back there. I'm like, really, <laughs> you do that at night? But 25 years, met on AOL, so <laughs> it's, it's allowed. Um, but the, um, the other ways you learn language are immersion, community, right? Um, coaching, being embedded, immersing yourself. So take this idea of the language and be thinking and looking about it. And you are the native speakers of this language for your organization. My clicker's stopping. Hey, Brian, my clicker stopped. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Appreciate it. Uh, maybe it's not the clicker. Maybe it's the slides. Is it the slide? I was worried when it stopped halfway. Okay, thank you. All right, so a few examples. And these are things that you can use back uh, at your virtual office. So take the VIA model, try it out. Um, say you're part of a new, newly formed team working on a new use case, and you wanna make sure everybody is sufficiently communicating and collaborating. There's a, you know the magazine Wired? Wired has a site called Wired Five Levels. And what Wired Five Levels does is it challenges an expert in the field of a topic, in this case, it's this woman who's an expert in machine learning, to teach what she knows about machine learning to five different people, starting with kindergartner. You do not really know <laughs> what you do unless you can explain it. Or, it's a, it's, a, it's a talent to be able to do that, and it's a muscle to practice. So you could have fun with this in your team. Say you have a use case team working on a particular problem. Take 30 minutes in a meeting and play around with this and role play it. And even have the non-expert have to try to explain it, because if they can't explain it in a safe room with each other, how on earth are the other stakeholders gonna understand it? So it's a great technique. You don't have to do five levels, but Two or three, probably a good a good way. Another one, um, and these are I've created something called the 20 Data Literacy Essentials, which is like what's the starting line for data literacy? And these are a couple of those. So another one on metrics and KPIs. Again, ways that you can help people remember. On have you, anybody heard of Goodhart's law? When a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. Okay, so if you if you go out and you go, okay, I'm going to teach you about Goodhart's law. Boring, right? But if you do this, you say, if you measure people on the number of nails made, what do you get? A lot of nails. If you measure people on the weight of nails made, you get a, a few heavy nails, right? So again, just a way to help people. And the reason you do that is to ask yourself, and again, get curious. I like saying get curious, kind of lean in and say, what are some of the unintended consequences of some of our metrics? Just a way to think about it. Understanding data sources. We all know what this is. Hopefully you have no allergic reactions. John Hopkins dashboard. 
There was a time with the John Hopkins dashboard where do you see the red dot just to the west of the coast of Africa in the ocean? Huge, remember, big dot, large concentration of cases. Why the large, this is your critical thinking, why the large concentration of cases to the west of Africa? You know, do you? Cr cruise ship, good, good guess. Yes, she got it, you had it too. So it's not islands, it's not cruise ships, that is zero latitude, zero longitude. They call it Null Island. So the point of this, if you go to people and you say, okay, when you are entering data and you leave a field empty, here is what's gonna happen in database logic. It's going to default to boring. <laughs> if you do this, you'll say that happens because somebody was entering a COVID case and they didn't enter location. And guess what? When people are rolling up the reports by location, that's zero, zero, and people are looking and going, oh, look at all the cases to the west of Africa, right? So w the point is, there are ways to make the point and to teach the point that are memorable and personal, and then you plant that seed, and then you can say, okay, now let's look at an example of how this works with a data set that you interact with, and how that, follow that data all the way to somebody making a decision and that that data not being entered had a serious effect. Last one, um, again, a, a something you never experience. Um, do you have any data that will fit my theory? <laughs> Love good old cognitive bias. Yes, Peter? I always get that question because my office is literally around the corner from the computer science department. So they come <laughs> at me all the time and say, have you got any data that looks like this? <laughs> That, and your answer is? <laughs> you're solving the problem in the wrong direction. Exactly. I also love this next one. Oh, it's not, oh, I, I replaced the site. There's a cartoon and it has um, a boardroom. Actually, can I go back? Um, so there's another, uh, another cartoon. It's a boardroom and it has um, a bunch of dogs sitting, it's a little cartoon dog sitting around and the, the, the chief dog is saying, um, uh, oh shoot, how does it go? Um, we, I just froze. Um, it's something about, um, oh, we did the, you, I asked for a competitive analysis and nobody thought to look at cats, like, right? <laughs> and then the pictures on the walls are like a dog bone and a ball or something, but it's the whole, you know, okay, do a competitive analysis and all you did was look at dogs, right? Nobody, or nobody looked at cats. So um, the point of this is use humor, use a little cartoon, get people engaged, and then, there, then tie it to a cheat sheet. So in cheat sheets, this and one in particular, these are all live links, 20 cognitive biases, anchoring bias, confirmation bias, all the different ones, right? Pick one or two each week and explore them. Come up with a personal example, come up with business examples. It's gonna create a rhythm in your business, okay? So these are just, just some ways that you can do that. Um, data storytelling, I just want to do just a quick shout out that great books for sure. Um, Cole's work, Brent's work, Zach's work, all amazing. Um, so these are great resources. They have like workshops and things, but there's also really simple things you can do. There's these little free storytelling lessons. Um, Zach has one with one minute data storytelling lessons and there's like 50 of them. Again, just pick one or two maybe come up with a theme for the month, and we're gonna do this. There's a lot of these little bites, and we know that people learn in bites, right? Give them a foundation, and then start <laughs> dripping these bites through. Okay, so why does this matter? It matters, number one, to upskill the workforce, modern workforce. Number two, I believe this unlocks what I like to call radical collaboration, collaboration among people that don't normally collaborate. So when you have the Walmart store clerk um, interacting with data, understanding the data that's processing around that, that operation, that store clerk knows what happens when it rains. So looking at that, you say blending of weather data, 
that person has that experience that no one else can see. So just even respecting that person to say, you know, there's data flowing through here. What is your experience? You open up channels of collaboration that haven't necessarily been there. Third, when you raise all boats with data literacy, then you maximize your capacity of your data scientists, your data engineers, your prompt engineers. And then finally, this is all what we mean by culture. Right? This is how we shift culture. Um, and for the CDOs trying to um, justify a data literacy program, this is about the cheapest insurance policy you can get on getting the value out of all the other investments you're making. Right? It is that, that little bit of last mile. All right, role of pioneers. Um, what is a pioneer? A pioneer goes first, right? A pioneer has grit. A pioneer is resourceful. A pioneer has first mover advantage. I have 60 people in a community who have been investing in data literacy for the last few years. I will tell you, they are big. I heard a great phrase from an MIT professor the other day that the work we're doing right now is rewiring the social circuitry of our organizations. I was like, oh, that's so good, because that is how much we're doing right now. And how do you do that? You do that with language and literacy and understanding. So as you get started on data literacy, you are ahead of everyone else on starting to rewire that social circuitry. The longer you wait, the longer, that it, it is not gonna happen on its own. If it was gonna, it would have already, <laughs> right? We're talking about massive change and a convergence of disciplines here, right? There are disciplines, um, so when I was at Gartner, um, it used to be that were, there were two different, different event tracks when I first got there. There was the EIM and MDM track for all the data management people, and there was the BI and analytics and data science track, whatever they called it. What is it now? The Data and Analytics Summit. The CDO role, CDAO, right? So this convergence is happening. The sooner you can support that integration of the language across the business stakeholders you're serving, the data and the analytics, that convergence is happening. You gotta support it with the language, right? Okay, so what can we learn from literacy pioneers or other pioneers? I would like to introduce you to three women. Two I bet you know. What does Dolly Parton do with literacy? Anybody know? Sends books to kids. Im uh, Imagination Library. So why does this matter? There's actually efforts underway right now to look at data literacy through K through 12 education. There's legislation in place and there are initiatives underway to significantly enhance the curriculum. You gotta catch kids at the beginning. When you think about STEM, data's not really called out in STEM. Science, technology, engineering, math, where's the data? I always wanna put like a little I in front of it, like I STEM, right? So data literacy has to be woven throughout. Starts with the kids. Dolly does that with books. Who's the, who's the second lady? Barbara Bush. Story about Barbara Bush. Uh, when she was, um, when it was identified that she was gonna be the first lady, um, the story goes, she was uh, jogging in a park one morning, trying to determine what her platform would be. I guess when you're the first lady, you determine a platform. I've never been a first lady, but I guess this is what you do. She was thinking to herself, drug epidemic, homelessness, poverty, um, education crisis, and she came to the conclusion, conclusion that a root of all of those societal issues is literacy. I just got chills. I still, like, it matters that much, right? So Barbara Bush, literacy pioneer, and she says the American dream is about equal opportunity for everyone who works hard, an equal chance. I believe that data literacy is an equal opportunity, that people that do not are not supported with data literacy will fall behind. I think it's that important. I think it's an employee value proposition to your employees. Third woman, I will give, um, I don't know, $50 to anybody that can name the woman on the right. Oh, good guess, yeah. No, this is a woman named Ruth Colvin. Um, Ruth Colvin 
is one of the most amazing literacy pioneers. She created the Literacy Volunteers of America. She was from Syracuse, New York. She, uh, want, she read the, the story goes, she read a newspaper one morning and it said that 17,000 people in the city of Syracuse could not read or write. She got the ladies at the church together and she said, we gotta fix this, who will help me? They created a tutor group. She had an old refrigerator in her basement that she had a whole bunch of books in and they started tutoring. That became the Literacy Volunteers of America and, and so on. She still tutors and this lady is 106 years old. They just had, she still golfs every week, still tutors, and we just had the Ruth Colvin Invitational, her inaugural golf tournament, and we were a sponsor, the Data Lodge, and I have a picture with her, and um, I just, this is what it means to pioneer to me. And the fact that they're all women, 74% of my community are women or people of color. I think diversity is leading this movement. So next time you wake up and you're like, oh, I'm kind of tired, think of Ruth, 106, yeah. I'm 56, I'm like, oof, I got 50 years less, okay. D literacy, data literacy is the new baseline literacy of our, of our generation. Uh, another question, black and white picture, back in the day, people looking towards the front, somebody up front, teacher holding a teapot, Anybody wanna take a guess at what's going on here? And I'll give you a hint. It is, um, it is at the Ford Motor Plant in Detroit. What are they teaching? Usually people say combustion engines. <laughs> what they're teaching is, it's actually the Ford English School. 1914, who were the employees in 1914 in the plants? Immigrants, what languages do immigrants speak? Different ones. You bring people together of different languages in a environment with safety issues. There were safety issues and there were efficiency issues because they didn't share a common language. Ford put in place the Ford English School and what's interesting about this story is they had been employing a large amount of interpreters and translators and I know translators is a big topic, like Analytics translators, and I get it, but that only goes so far, right? It's only gonna take you so far. But what happened is it actually supported the employees in becoming citizens. And there's a lot of stories about how they actually would get their citizenship based on receiving this education. So these, I'm trying my best to inspire you <laughs> in the pioneering work and I don't know how we make this effect without rewiring the social circuitry. So data literacy programs, and I'll end with this. Um, I'm gonna tell you what's in a data literacy program, show you some examples, and then we'll have about, um, I don't know, six minutes for questions. So data literacy program includes three things. The very middle one is the one everybody thinks about, which is training. It is in the middle for a reason. It is the cornerstone, no question. It is assessments, it is training and development, but it's also language development, and it's also working with your HR partners on enhancing job descriptions, enhancing performance management, right? There's a whole lot of HR discipline work that goes on in there. But there are two, book, or two bookends that are critically important to a data literacy program that are usually overlooked. The first is engagement. That whole mindset part of the definition of data literacy, you're not going to solve that with the development piece. The engagement piece of your program is first of all, how do you engage the leaders? Number one issue my community tells me is what is our intervention with our leadership? How do we get our leaders on board? We just created an executive workshop for that because it needs a special treatment on how to, and I heard it in one other session, how do you help leaders um, ad, as advocates, but also as um, modeling the abilities. So they are the greatest teachers, good or bad. <laughs> and if they ask good questions, even if they know the answer, right? Or if they're demonstrating something, that will, that will send a stronger message than anything they say. So what is the leadership engagement? 
What is the community structure? You don't necessarily have to create like a brand new community, but you need to enlist ambassadors and advocates. How many of you have some kind of a COE, like an analytics COE? Yep, those are great channels for this work. They're already coaching people. They just don't have a structure to support them. And then what is the communications craft around this? I strongly recommend some kind of branding. You, I have clients, um, so Mayo Clinic makes it invisible. They weave it into everything. And then I have others that make it really explicit and give it a really lively brand, right? So you, you could take either approach, um, but you wanna be intentional about your communications. The one on the right is enablement. This one usually is, oh, you need you know, your data catalog and your data dictionary, and how do you have a shared language without business glossary and dictionary? All makes sense. Office hours, people want coaching. This is where generative AI is exploding this whole page. So the ability for conversational AI and that augmented experience, I call it, one of my clients calls it, and I steal it, it's called data literacy by design. The UX, and I think, Ashley, you and I were talking about this, you have to work with your UX developers now on how can you guide people in the experience and don't put it all on their backs in training. So this is as simple as a lot of the, the um, technology providers have things like hovering over a data element to display the definition. How many times do you think people are gonna go find the dictionary, right? But if it's displayed in the context, they'll use it, right? So very intentional. Um, you better get these other pieces moving because that one's taken off like a rocket ship. Then there's the program management. I call this conducting the data literacy orchestra. There's a lot of moving pieces here, a lot of top down, bottom up grassroots, a lot of different pieces to it. I will not talk through all of these, but I just want to acknowledge these organizations, the ones with a little asterisk are friends of the data lodge, who are pioneering this work. There are others that are doing this work. I know Starbucks is doing great work. I just couldn't find a nice story about the work that they're doing. Um, I, the work that Colgate Palmolive is doing, I met with um, the team, love what they're doing, have to represent them. But if you want to learn some stories about what people are doing, check out these articles. You can e easily share this. But look at things like the country of Nepal. Data literacy for prosperous Nepal. That's been going on since 2019. Uh, International Red Cross, right? So look at these examples, they're really powerful, and shout out to my pioneers who are, I know, watching, my friends, uh, even if not on here, I have US Department of Education is watching, Lane, um, my Worthington friends, my um, Sony PlayStation friends, there are so many that are doing phenomenal work, and I just want to do a, a shout out, and I just missed a bunch of them and going to annoy them. So um, last, whoa, last thing on this is five myths and misconceptions about data literacy. It's not just training. It's not just about internal structured data. That I in the VIA model, it's the diversity of data, internal, external, structured, unstructured. It is not just about visualization and storytelling. A lot of data literacy has an impression that it is about visualization and storytelling because that's where a lot of the original marketing came from. It's an important piece, but it's not just that. We're not trying to make everybody a data scientist or a junior data scientist. And it's not just a work thing. Keep these in mind as you're interacting with people because they're gonna come up as preconceived notions. So my final comments, number one, if you do nothing else, if you have not started yet, get really crystal clear on your case for change. It's the first thing we do in boot camp. excavate your case for change. You want no questions when you start designing your program on what you're solving for, who you're solving it for, and what examples are and where you're gonna start. Case for change, number one. Number two, you have to look at how this fits in the context of other things going on. I say that data literacy lives at the intersection of digital, data, and workforce development. I know when someone calls me up and they want a 30 minute call, that if they bring their HR partner or their L&D partner, gonna be good. They're already thinking about that strategic partnership. 
Example, the Mayo Clinic, we did, a, we did a boot camp with the Mayo team. They brought people from Center for Digital Health, they brought people from the CDO office, and they brought people from the leadership and learning and development team. Rock stars. Last part, do not scope it as only training, and there is no reason for you to be starting with a blank piece of paper. You don't have time for that, right? So don't go it alone. There's a lot of great resources out there. There's even free resources out there, but please reach out, have a call with me. I, I will do my best to help you uh, help navigate for you. So with that, um, you, there's some activities in here you can take with you, but I'd rather leave the rest of the time. Last quote, Margaret Mead, it's up to you. You're the committed citizens that will make this happen. So with that, um, there's some resources and there's Cooper. There's the mascot. He loves to read all the math and data science books. Oh, we're at time. Oh, we're at time. But if you're willing to stay I certainly will. Yeah, okay. okay. Thanks everyone for attending today. Appreciate Thanks. It. Thanks for all the interaction. Appreciate it. Bye.